Today, February 21st, we celebrate the first Sunday in Lent. It's the first Sunday of this new season of the church year. Traditionally, the gospel lesson for the first Sunday in Lent is Jesus' temptation by the devil in the wilderness. And that sets the theme for this day as we see Jesus as our substitute taking on our enemy, the devil, and winning the battle with temptation on our behalf. Let's begin our worship this day with the opening responses. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. It is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Let us pray. Almighty Father, every enemy must surrender to you, even the devil, who continually seeks to tempt us and make us fall. By your son's defeat of temptation, deliver our own souls from danger, so that we may find peace in his victory and finally overcome through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the hymn. The first lesson for the first Sunday in Lent is from the book of Romans, chapter 8. We begin reading at verse 31. In this section of Romans, chapter 8, the Apostle Paul points out to us that if Christ is on our side, if God is on our side, then nothing, not even the devil's powers, will be able to oppose us. Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? 
Who can bring any ac an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, has been raised. He's also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the first lesson. The gospel lesson for the first Sunday in Lent is from Mark's gospel, chapter 1. We begin reading at verse 12. We have here Mark's account of Jesus' temptation. At once the Spirit sent him into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Here ends the gospel. May you have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. The word of God for our consideration on this first Sunday in Lent is from the gospel lesson for the day, Mark chapter 1. We begin reading at verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when I shop at a bookstore, the first section that I visit is the theology section. I know that I'm not completely weird in this because I am never the only one looking at those books. The theology section is dominated by shelves that have the title Christian Living. And a great number of books in that category bear something like the phrase victorious Christian life in their titles. Now, I don't want to deny that Christians can grow in their sanctification, in their ability to resist certain sins and to live a fruitful life, a life of love and service to others. But somehow, victorious Christian life has always seemed to me to be a, a little presumptuous for someone who is still fighting with sin's battles. It seems that it would be best applied to a person at his or her funeral, you know, when the final victory is finally in hand. Since Adam and Eve, the only person who has ever actually lived a victorious Christian life from beginning to end is Jesus. The life that is on display in our gospel lesson today, is that life with all of its power and all of its promise in these words that come to us from Mark's gospel as we begin the season of Lent. The challenges and the message of Jesus' early gospel ministry give us a glimpse of the victorious Christian life. Lived in Jesus' life, and proclaimed in Jesus' gospel. 
Now, in the preceding verses of Mark, Jesus had just been baptized. At his baptism, you remember, he was marked for the beginning of his ministry. It was a, an event in his life that sort of served as his ordination. And it began this cosmic battle that he would have with the devil and all the evil forces and all of his evil enemies throughout his life. In order to get that battle started, the spirit then led him out into the wilderness. At once, the spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. For Jesus, the victorious Christian life did not mean that he never knew what it was like to live out in life's wildernesses, to live a life without the comforts and the companions that help to make our lives more or less tolerable while we are on our earthly journey. We know from the other Gospels that this six-week stay in the desert did not include a meal plan. He ate nothing for 40 days. His only earthly companions, Mark tells us, were the, the wild animals. Not like having your favorite pet, your golden retriever or Siamese cat, along for companionship. And, and the point of this all seems to be that, humanly speaking, Jesus was in constant danger from his surroundings in the wilderness. This was a hungry and this was a lonely time for him. Does that look like victorious Christian living to you? Our own wildernesses may be more wildernesses in a metaphorical sense than a literal experience as Jesus had here. But even if we are not stuck in some remote corner of a literal desert, our lives have had their own wildernesses, their own desert adventures, if you will, times and places where we were very alone, times and places when we seemed to have nothing that we needed, we, and, and we didn't like it. There is the Christian teen who has classmates who are behaving badly, and, and the teen wants to stand up for what is right, but it isn't winning them any friends. More and more, it seems that they find themselves isolated and alone. There is a young Christian parent who is trying to make ends meet. Maybe you're jobless or maybe you're simply underemployed. The pressure is extra intense because there are extra mouths to feed in the family. And because you think you don't want to have to go to family members or friends because they're just going to suspect you of asking them for something for help again. You struggle along the best that you can because you think you're going to have to get through on your own, hungry and alone. There's the Christian senior whose contemporaries are an ever-shrinking group. When invited to far too many funerals, you, you begin to feel like your own time is going to be up soon. The, the children and grandchildren are far too busy to visit, or when they do take time, it may seem as though they're simply checking off a, a task on a list, distracted by the next thing that they have to go and do. Or, or maybe advancing age and failing powers means you need more help with things than anyone is able or willing to give. It's your own version of hungry and alone. There are thousands of versions of this life experience, wilderness or desert, you see. None of them look very victorious. They all look more defeated. So why does God let this happen? Why, why, what did I ever do to deserve this kind of thing? For, for, for Jesus, life was victorious, not, not because he never lived in a wilderness. It was victorious because he lived there in an utter trust in his father. Starving alone, he did not entertain uh, thoughts and questions about God the Father abandoning him. He didn't complain about how hard and miserable it was. He was actually content with these 40 days just the way they were. 
And we haven't even gotten to the hardest part yet. He was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. Mark doesn't give us any of the details like the other gospel writers do uh, about the particular things with which Jesus was being tempted. He, He doesn't focus on three individual temptations as Matthew and Luke do in their gospels. Rather, Mark puts his emphasis on the fact that Jesus was in the wilderness this entire 40 days being tempted all along the way with many different temptations, all of them being orchestrated by the master tempter himself. No potential weakness went unexplored. And perhaps this is where things get really difficult, where they become really hard for you and for me. We are moved to contemplate what is your your personal weak spot. I won't mention her by name, but are you ever like a a popular singer whose father is in charge of all of her affairs, her affairs yet today, even though she is nearly 40 years old? It seems as though that as, as long as she is under someone else's care directing what goes on in her life, she does fine. But put her out there all alone and her life begins to unravel as she makes one bad choice after another. Maybe you're like the pro golfer from a number of years ago who almost ruined his career, definitely ruined his family and his marriage when it was discovered that he had dozens of mistresses scattered all across the country. Okay, now, ordinary people don't have so much opportunity as someone like that, so maybe the the same kind of weakness in terms of temptation shows up in our lives during unmonitored time that we have on the computer surfing the internet. Or, or maybe uh, when there's unchaperoned time you spend with just one other person of the opposite sex to whom you're not married. Or, or, or maybe you have more in common with the wealthy actress who couldn't control her shoplifting or the rapper who, whose angry and violent outbursts landed him in jail. So, so you and I are relatively little people. We don't have so much public scrutiny focused upon our lives. And as a result, our weaknesses don't come under the uh, same kind of criticism or uh, widespread knowledge. But give me enough time and we'll uncover the weak spots For you or for me, uh, undoubtedly, Satan already has all the rest of the time by so many different measures on so many different issues, you and I can be such kind and respectable people. But test that weak spot and my victorious Christian life goes down in defeat. For Jesus, it was not that he had never faced temptation. We can safely say that Jesus was tempted and tested on a level far more difficult than anyone before or since. But Jesus lived a victorious Christian life because he defeated every temptation every time. He didn't, he, he didn't even give in just a little. He, he is, his will to do what is godly and holy didn't ever budge. Now, here's the good news. Jesus' victorious Christian life is yours. You know, so often we look at the account of Jesus' temptation in the desert, and we think that it is a roadmap to overcoming temptation on our own. Fight back with God's word. But even without this story, you probably already knew that that's the thing you were supposed to do. The, The problem isn't with knowing what to do here. The problem is putting it into practice. But that is just where we need the good news of this gospel. When it comes to putting in practice, in Jesus you already have. Jesus is our Savior, you see, our substitute. And just like his death for our sins is counted as our death, just like his his payment is counted as our payment, so his victory over temptation gets chalked up is our victory. His perfect trust in the wilderness, his perfect resistance to the devil's traps, they all get entered onto our spiritual accounts. Jesus' victory here means that on the last day, your record book will will record a perfect season 
for you in a winless season for the devil, regardless of how each of your individual temptations appeared to turn out in real time. Jesus' victory is your victorious Christian life. And that same victory is proclaimed in Jesus' gospel. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. People in every age have worried and complained about the times in which they lived. In Jesus' day, the the times were considered evil because the Roman invader had ruled the land. Greek and Roman conquerors for hundreds of years had been in control of these people, and their evil and worldly culture had seduced many of the Jewish people also to adopt that, that godless way of life. The voice of the prophets had been silent now for nearly four centuries. In our days, uh, times are considered evil because so many dishonest politicians rule the land. Hollywood culture seduces m- many of our people. The voices of pastors and churches can barely be heard above those that proclaim that God is dead or he's irrelevant or someone far different than we've always heard him to be. And as the Bible teaches us, he is. Jesus has something to different to say about our times. The time has come. Understand that the word he uses for time here isn't just a word for time on a clock or a day on the calendar. It it means the right time, the, the time that fits, the time that has arranged itself to be just set up as we need it to be. The times may be evil, but something in God's timing for us is just right. The kingdom of God is near. That kingdom is not near in the sense of coming soon, but rather the kingdom has arrived. The invasion is already underway with Jesus' arrival in our world, and it's further along than it was in Jesus' own day. Christian writer C.S. Lewis coined the term the enemy occupied territory as a way of referring to the world in which we live. The world belongs to God, but an enemy has temporarily taken over its leadership. What he means is more or less the same thing that that Martin Luther meant in the words that we sung in the hymn for this day, A Mighty Fortress, when he refers to the devil as this world's prince. Uh, Paul talks much the same way in his letter to the Ephesians chapter 2 about those who Follow the ways of this world and of the ruler who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Our world is largely under the rule, under the control of a usurper who has taken souls captive to do his will. But Jesus is the rightful king, and he has returned. His kingdom is here. In our time and in our place, the enemy hasn't disappeared or stopped fighting, but he is in retreat. And with the return of the true and proper king, more and more souls are being won back to his side, turned away from the enemy, and made partakers and participants in the victory Jesus has most surely won. The weapons of this war, by which Jesus turns former servants of the enemy into his own allies are the words of a simple message. Repent and believe the good news. This is more than a a single moment in time response. Repentance isn't limited to a, a day when Jesus first invaded our hearts. Each one of us has a lifetime of sinful behaviors to discover and to abandon. A head full of worldly ways of thinking that that needs to be changed. A a heart full of selfish desires that need to be hunted down and executed. A retired pastor I know once told me about a woman in his congregation whom he asked, are you sure you're going to heaven when you die? Now, many of you maybe recognize that question is one of what is sometimes called the two key questions for getting a 
conversation about sin and grace, about salvation, started when you're doing mission work, when you're doing an uh, evangelism visit with someone. And sometimes we pastors may ask them of our members as well, just to get an idea of how they're thinking. So the pastor asks the woman the question, and the woman's answer to the pastor is, oh, yes, pastor, I am, I'm sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Generally speaking, we consider that to be the right answer. But the pastor followed up by asking her why she was so sure. Why? It's because I never sin. Not the right answer. The believer is always fighting the battle with sin. And repentance needs to continue until the day we die. But just as constant as repentance is the good news in which we put our faith. Do you sin? Jesus died to forgive it. Are you too weak to save yourself? Well, Jesus did everything God required. Is your rap sheet so long that you could wallpaper your entire house with the list of things that you've done? Jesus' sacrifice covers every crime and even more. Were you a spiritual failure? A longtime agent even for the other side? Well, Jesus has made you a member of God's own family, one of God's own children. Do you have one foot in the grave? Jesus promises that one day he's going to walk you right back out of that grave again. That's the victory proclaimed in Jesus' gospel, a victorious Christian life that will never end. Today, on the first Sunday in Lent, Jesus wins a victory over Satan's temptations that we could never have managed on our own. On Good Friday, at the very end of our Lenten season, Jesus wins a victory over sin and death, proved it on Easter morning, and again, it was all a victory we never could have managed on our own. Thank God for his victorious Christian life. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Having heard the word of God, we join to confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join in prayer today as we pray for God's help on us as we continue to face the attacks of Satan and temptation. Let's also remember to pray for those who are affected by the winter storms this week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your son knew hunger in the wilderness, but his reliance on you did not fail. Give us a steady trust in your promises and hope in your final deliverance. Lover of mankind, you sent your gospel into all the world to deliver people from the power of the devil. Pour your spirit on all pastors and servants of your church. Empower them to proclaim your word with grace and courage. Ruler of the nations, you command us to honor those in authority. Show your grace to our president, our public servants, and all who serve in our armed forces. Give them wisdom so that they pursue policies that will bless our nation. Make us a blessing to the nations of the world. Lord of creation, you provide all our needs. We thank you for keeping us safe through the winter storms this week. We ask you to provide relief to those whose property was damaged health and healing to people injured in the storms, and comfort to families who've lost loved ones. Open the hearts of your people, including us, to provide help and assistance to those in need. 
God of mercy, we command all who are sick or suffering, the hospitalized, the persecuted, the lonely, the afflicted, the grieving and the dying into your gracious and loving arms. Bring the comfort of your spirit to each broken body, troubled mind, or hurting soul. Grant us these things, and whatever else you know we need for the sake of him who triumphed over the devil and rose in victory, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is one with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray as our Savior taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the blessing of the eternal God be upon us, his light to guide us, his presence to shelter us, his peace to unite us. Amen. We close with the hymn. 